Okay, we're ready to start our second session uh, of this conference. Uh, you're going to get very tired of me by the end of the day, but I think this mostly takes care of what I need to do, uh, is having the pleasure and privilege to chair the second session. Uh, we have a large number of speakers, um, but they've all got very important messages to say. Um, if we could pull up, there's uh, just a few slides I have by way of introduction. I'll just make a comment. Uh, I was asked to uh, chair this session on the diagnosis and treatment of mesothelioma. Uh, simply put, the asbestos-related diseases, be it asbestosis, lung cancer, mesothelioma, are either not treatable or very poorly treatable. Uh, we have people who are uh, trying to find ways to do this. Uh, I've been in this uh, area of work long enough to see that the drugs that we now have uh, work a lot better than what we had decades ago when we essentially had nothing. And uh, uh, the time frame from diagnosis to uh, people passing away was very short. Uh, that has been lengthened. Uh, we'll hear about some of that today. And we even have some new drugs out there that uh, are not universally uh, uh, successful when they're used, uh, but new drugs like Keytruda, uh got a lot of press with Jimmy Carter, of course. We'll hear a little about that today from one of our speakers in this session. Uh, seems to be a drug that if it works, it works very well. Uh, but it doesn't work with everybody. Uh, so that the, the landscape of treatment is changing, uh, but I just keep going back to the mantra that you've heard me say over the years that you heard me say this morning, prevention is still the way to go. Now with that said, uh, all of the speakers, they're all listed in your programs. I'm not going to do any introductions of the speakers. You can read about everybody, but let me ask uh, Heather Von St. James to come up and share with us her particular story. Thank you and welcome. Like you said, my name is Heather Von St. James, and 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with malignant pleural mesothelioma. I'd never heard the word like most people. I looked at the doctor like, what, what is this? And I remember looking at my husband, and he looked at the doctor and he said, oh boy, this is bad. And at the time, we had a three and a half month old baby, and he looked at me and he said, if you don't do anything, you have 15 months. I just had a new child, you know, we were just starting off our life as parents. All that I could think of was raising my daughter and I was given a death sentence. But the doctor looked at us and said, but there is something you can do. And so I met hope. My hope was in this man, Dr. David Sugarbaker. When we met him, he said that I was a perfect candidate for a groundbreaking surgery at the time called an extrapleural pleural for those of you who don't know what that means, in layman's terms, basically they took out my entire left lung. They took the lung, the diaphragm, the lining of my heart, and my sixth rib. And during that surgery, they also did a heated chemo wash where they pumped in heated chemotherapy. It was heated to 140 degrees, washed it around for an hour. They call it the shake and bake. And then they, rinsed, they washed it back out, closed me up, and then I was sent home to recover. So here I am, 10 years later. I'd like to say it was as easy as that, but <laughs> it, it, there, there's been a lot of ups and downs. But throughout the whole series of treatments, I lost my career as a hairdresser. I know that's hard to believe I was a hairdresser. Um, but I lost my career, something I was very passionate for, and I was looking for something else. I needed something else. Then I met this woman. Her name is Linda Reinstein. I met her at a conference and she and I got to talking and she told me to share my story with her. So I did. And she launched or inspired in me the desire to share my story with others and I saw the power that that story has. Everybody has a story in their lives. Everybody has some sort of something to share with others that somebody's going to be inspired from. This happens to be what I do. So Linda 
asked me to speak at her next conference, and I was honored to do so. So I recognize a lot of you because I've been coming to this now for six or seven years. So she said, share your story. And with that, a, mo a movement was born. I started a blog. I started getting involved with ADAO and with other organizations. My husband and I throw a fundraiser party every year on the anniversary of my surgery. If you see here, um, this is pictures from our 10th annual this last year. In February, we throw a giant party called Lung Leaving Day because it's the day my lung left. So we have a big party where we invite, you know, 100, 120 of our closest friends over to our house. We throw plates into a bonfire with fears written on it, and we raise money for mesothelioma research and asbestos education. It gets the word out. People from all over the world know about it and celebrate in their own way either by like tearing plates and burning them. Some of them go out to their own bonfire and smash a plate. Others just, you know, write stuff on a piece of paper and tear it up. But people are moved by the thought and the idea that you can start over and facing your fears and moving forward. And people are really moved by that story. So we've been able to use this day not only as awareness, but as a way for people to learn about asbestos and learn about mesothelioma and raise money. This year we raised $12,000. So our goal was 10,000, so I was really happy to uh, raise that amount of money. So, and also by getting involved, I do the Miles for MISO with uh, Linda every year um, down in, uh, out in Illinois, which is a ton of fun. You can see Marilyn and I there walking and having a blast. And this year I got to walk for a dear friend of mine. His name is John Panza, who's also a mesothelioma patient. So it was a great honor to be able to walk for somebody and represent other mesothelioma patients. So this is just a couple of ways that I found a voice and I've been able to get involved. The other things I do are outreach and advocacy for, through the blog. I have a blog through mesothelioma.com that reaches thousands upon thousands of people. Every week I hear from people all over the world. The most recent was from a gentleman from Tunisia whose mother has mesothelioma. It's incredibly humbling for people from all over the world to reach out to me and ask me for help. I'm just like, I'm just some chick who had this disease. How can I help you? But just by talking to somebody who knows about it <clears throat> has incredible power. And I've been able to help through the network that I've met through these conferences. I've been able to give these people places to go and doctors to talk to. So these are just a couple of bigger um, websites that I've been actually able to be on. Um, one is I had cancer recently. They, they featured our story about lung leaving day. Um, the Momentum blog at Baylor University where my surgeon now works has been a great thing. And just the local paper. And it's amazing how much press you can get by sharing your story. Everybody here has a story and I encourage you to share it with somebody. Whether it be a blog, share your story on the ADAO website. It's an incredible place to get started. But I found through mom bloggers an incredible resource, not only of help and support, but a community that has been incredibly uplifting and supportive for me throughout this whole journey. And the other advocates that I've met through the Mom Blog Network, oh, my dad died of that. Oh, my grandfather had that. Oh, my gosh, my aunt had that. And it's amazing how small the world becomes when you start sharing your story and getting involved. The other way that I've started making change happen is going to Washington, D.C. with Linda. Boy, I was on a complete, like, adrenaline rush for a week after going the first time. I don't know if it was shutting down the guy who asked what it was, how much it would cost to ban asbestos was the best thing, when I basically told him off and said, how would you like to get a million dollars in medical bills by the time you're 40? You know, he, he was just like quiet after that. The whole room was quiet. But they don't understand the cost, the personal cost of asbestos. All what they care about is, what is it gonna cost the government? Well. 10,000 people a year are dying, and that's a cost that you can't put a monetary value on. And I think we really have been able to hammer that through these kids. 
And Linda's always said there's power in sharing your story with these, these people at Washington. I was like, yeah, okay, that'll be cool, but I didn't realize how important it was until I went and was able to do that. A simple act of calling up, meeting with a staffer, telling them your story, writing to your congressman or your senator has incredible power, especially with the laws that they're passing now. We have a voice, and I encourage each and every one of you to use it. There's great links through Linda's website, through the ADAO.us, to get to these, um, to your senators and to the Congress people, to tell them about the FACT Act and not to pass it, to talk about these other great acts. Working with the Environmental Working Group has been incredible for me. All these people are there for us, and they need our voice. Asbestos isn't going to get banned until more of us speak up, more of us share our story. And I know Mike was able to be there. You can see in the pictures. Our first dream team, there's a couple of you here. Hi, Mike, wave. You should have seen the people in the room, these young guys, when Mike is telling his story. And they were silent. There's so much power in sharing your story as a patient. When I told them that I was diagnosed because my dad hugged me, they just, they were blown away and then they couldn't believe that asbestos hasn't been banned. So getting involved and having a voice is so important. And it can be something as simple as making a phone call, as attending a conference. It doesn't have to take a ton of time and a ton of energy. So I encourage you to each to share your story Continue support and advocacy with ADAO, and I look forward to being here for another 10 or 20 years. Thank you.